Almost there, one more time. Cool, thank you. So this is actually the largest registration list we've ever had, so I'm very, very proud of that. Um, I'm sure Ankur is very proud of that as well. Um, but it's also a very special day for us. This is actually our 10th uh, Achievers Tech Talk. So round of applause for all of you guys for making that happen. It's been a long journey over the last year and a half, but um, it's all because of you guys. So just before I get started, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, our meetup group has actually grown from 830 people to 930. Uh, we're so close to 1,000, so hopefully you can tell your friends and help us get there. Um, as always, all the slides, resources posted on the meetup group, all videos if you want to share with your friends or if you know somebody that missed it tonight, will be on achievers.com slash tech. And as always, big shout out to our drink sponsor, Steam Whistle. Without them, uh, you guys wouldn't have beer tonight. So, uh, Awesome. So, uh, a few months ago, a gentleman reached out to me uh, saying that he would love to do a talk for our group. Um, and I don't think that's, that's not only a testament to the community that we've built here together uh, and the impact that we've had, but also speaks to, to his passion and what you will see here tonight. Um, this gentleman uh, was ranked one of the number one top independent Facebook app developers with 10,000 applications, uh, leveraging his work in a reach of over 200 million users. Um, I could list more and more accomplishments, but I'm sure I'll start sealing a little bit of his thunder. So without further ado, growth hacker, developer, founder, uh, all the way here from New York, Ankur Nagpal. Thank you. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here with you guys. Feels good to frankly just be in a room with people. I spent all day today recording an online course, which if you've done it is like, it's depressing. You're in front of a computer, you're like talking to a big ass microphone, it's, it's weird. But it's nice to finally be here with you guys. Uh, I'd love to get a sense of who you guys are. Like how many people are here for the first time? This is your first Achievers Tech Talk. Wow. Zaki, you need to work on your retention, man. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Cool. How many of you guys are technical or kind of technical? OK, sorry to disappoint you. This talk is not technical at all. But how many of you run your own company or want to run your own company? OK, awesome. Um, so I'm going to start with getting to a quick introduction about myself uh, to understand kind of where I'm coming from. It all started back in 2007. I was an intern at Amazon. It was my freshman summer. I kind of hated my life. I was in Seattle. I thought I wanted to be an engineer. That like, internship broke that dream. I was just like, I, I suck at this. I'm a terrible developer. And I didn't have much to do with my time. Like, I didn't know anyone in town. But it coincided with the launch of the Facebook platform. So. I started hacking around. I made a couple of useful apps. I was talking to someone about this today, but the first app I ever built was Fantasy Cricket, just because I'm a huge cricket fan. And we're in Toronto, so there's enough Indian people to like, understand that. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, I started out with like, just building shit that I thought was cool and that people would like. But turns out, like, I was trying to build useful stuff. No one cared. And then I happened to build my first uh, personality quiz ever. It was called, How Good a Lover Are You? <laughs> and within, with, no, it was stupid. Within two weeks, we hit 300,000 people. All of a sudden, we were making real money. And I was like, wait a second. Like this, like there, there's a business here. So I spent the next three years building pretty much everything you saw on Facebook and hated. Uh, we built the first ever personality quiz with and then followed it up with 200 identical quizzes with different content. We built the gift application creator, which allowed you to send your friends random gifts, which meant nothing because it was just, it was an application where you sent invitations that were gifts. And the whole purpose of the application was to send more invitations. Um, we built the first ever friend quiz, which is you'd get, no, you'd get notifications like, your friend just answered this question. Do you think Ankur is cool? Click here to find out what he or she said. Again, like very viral, grew really fast. So we built all these really viral apps, reached a lot of people, which was good because at the time we were an independent company, so my only focus, my, like literally the only thing I cared about was growth. 
Like we didn't, we made like a penny a user, but that was fine because we had lots of people. All like my focus for years and years and years was what can I do to get the most number of eyeballs? And in the process, I developed tips, techniques, like things, like strategies that I will share with you that are, like a lot of them are Facebook specific, but there's like, they usually come from a place where there's an underlying user psychology. And I hope, I hope you'll enjoy it. So I'm going to get started with the first one. It's somewhat provocatively titled Friends with Benefits. I haven't watched the movie, but I heard it's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> How many Facebook friends do you have? Rhetorical question, I don't really care. But how many Facebook friends do you care about? The point here being, in general, most people don't care about all their Facebook friends. I certainly don't. I care about like 14, no offense to the, the 1,200 others. But the point is, most friend inviters still look like this. Which, when you think about it, does not, does not make sense, right? Like, we all care about few friends more than others. They care about us more. Yet most people use a default standard Facebook friend inviter. Even those that build their own generally sort friends alphabetically. And one of the first kind of optimizations I made, which at the time no one did, was to change how you think about this. So do you, do you guys have any ideas like how else could we sort this inviter? Say you have a page, you're inviting people. How else would you sort it? Good one. Can you repeat that? He said how much we interact with each other. How would you, okay, just how would you measure that? Like, get technical with me for a second. How would you measure? Uh, I'm sorry? You can't access messages, but okay, number of, number of wall posts in which direction, or just both directions? Okay. So just again, to get technical for a second, by interest you mean the items they've liked on Facebook because that's all the data that's available to you. Okay, that's, that's one option. Number of mutual friends? Interesting, I'll talk about that in a second. Any other ideas here? Location. Location, that's a good one. I've actually never tested that. Like but same school or work at the same place? Another good idea. So I, I, the reason I ask is I've tested most of these things. I haven't single-handedly tested location. But you guys are right, like proximity of friendship is single-handedly the biggest, biggest indicator in getting, in getting more targeted invites. And someone said mutual friends, which is, who said mutual friends over here? That's interesting because that was one of my first ideas, but it never worked. Like I tested it. People like did not align well with who they shared the most mutual friends with. My personal hypothesis is it might be that you tend to share the most mutual friends with whoever you went to high school with that added everyone. Like, we all have those people. Like, that's my own hypothesis, but when we tested the data, it didn't work. The one thing that worked better than anything else we've ever done is who you share the most number of photos with. So what we did is we read your photo tags, and we found out who you're most likely to be in a picture with. And this worked so well that we actually built a viral application that was called your best friend predictor. And all we did is we read your photo tags, like who you're in the most pictures with. We're like, these five people are probably your best friends. And it was amazing. It went viral until it got shut down because of too many terms of service complaints saying this application is creepy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that works really well. Um, profile interaction works really well as well, but not to the same degree. But collectively, they're super, super powerful. Mutual friends never worked. I haven't tested location. Location would work, but in my, from what I've seen, photo tags is, I mean, it's, it's beautiful as to how well it works. Depending on your product, you can also do it by the target demographic. I was recently talking to someone that was working on, I don't know, like he was doing something with wine. And I was like, why are you just showing the default inviter? Like, at minimum, you want to eliminate people under 21 kind of see what market research says as to who is your target demographic and do that at least. You know, I mean, if it says you want to find people between the ages of 28 and 34, go after them, sorry. So this is an interesting hack I discovered, but I found a way on Facebook to actually find out what smartphone people use. Um, I, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but if anyone here kind of 
has worked with the Facebook platform and can tell me how it's possible, I will like buy you a beer. If you're going to do it now, you're just going to ruin this entire thing. But go for it. Tell me. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I'll go for it. So you can see, you can see what device they logged in with, uh, and just test You can't do that algorithmically. Like programmatically, you can't. How do you do that? Like maybe I don't know something. In API. They uh, give like in what in what API? Like. So if I ask for like personal information in the list, there's like devices tab returns like iPhone, Android, or whatever it is. Okay, that's new, and I'm completely embarrassed <laughs> if that's true. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, do you know when that? Do you know when that happened? Now that I'm entirely embarrassed. Okay. Um, <laughs> Could you figure out which uh, applications are installed? Uh, yeah, that was close to what my technique was. Yep, that that was that was that was the technique that that we used back back in the day, and it was the only available way. And now Chinmay has completely embarrassed me. So, <laughs> <laughs> awesome! I'll buy you a beer. I'll stick. I'll stick to my promise. Um, any other hands? I saw. Yep, that's a that's another that's another good one. Uh, all, that's a that's another good idea. Uh, the image just I'm sorry. I can't hear you. By the what? I'm not. The dimensions. Oh, that would work to a degree. In general, you just get the dimensions of the Facebook canvas. But cool. I'm gonna move on pass the slide and forget this ever happened. Um, OK, so how well does this strategy work, the whole idea of kind of changing, of you know, reprioritizing your friend list? So this actually worked really well on the gift application that I talked about. I'm going to explain it one last time, because a lot of this talk has to do with these gift applications. The, the application was essentially an image, an inviter, and a send button. And you were sending copies of the image to the person, but the significance was you got a hug, they'd get a request saying, Ankur sent you a hug, like, won't you accept it, with like a big accept button. And I spent a very long time trying to optimize this application to make it viral with no success. I think I was getting people to send out six or seven GIFs on average. But, and I like, did a lot of stuff to get it to like eight or nine, but it, not enough people were accepting these GIFs. It, like, it didn't, did not seem to matter. So that's when I decided to kind of reprioritize the friend list. And all of a sudden, what happened is people actually sent out fewer requests when they saw their real friends up there. But your real friends were three times more likely to accept these requests, which is really, really interesting. Like this, so we were sending out fewer outbound messages, yet all of a sudden, we were a viral application. And this is really important. And this is something I tell companies I work with all the time. Like too many, too many people talk about growth in terms of how you can send out a lot of stuff, but it's much easier to focus on the receive side. It's much easier to get twice as many people to accept the messages you're sending rather than getting people to send out twice as many messages. Like you send out a lot of messages, people call you spammy. You get people to accept twice as many requests, you're a great product. So that's the takeaway from the first one. The second. Any questions about the first, the first hack before we move on to the second one? Cool. Um, the second one is called artificial scarcity. Uh, my background in college was economics, so we learned a lot about artificial scarcity. I'm sure you're familiar with it. But it was always in a negative light. It was always like this company hoarded this commodity, created an artificial scarcity, and drove up the prices. Like, illegal monopolistic practice, but clearly, like, I, like, clearly there's something there with artificial scarcity. And I started thinking about how can I apply artificial scarcity to product design. So I went back to my trusty gift application, which at the time said, send all your friends a hug. And I imposed an artificial limit that did not exist. You can send 12 more hugs today. All of a sudden, invitations, which is what I wanted them to send, like it was a commodity that meant nothing to me. I put a limit on it. I said, like, I think I'd put a limit of maybe 20, 25, 
and I tracked it visually saying whenever you sent a hug it was like oh you only have 19 more today man like better get on that like 19 more it's running out and this worked really well and uh, like it worked really well but then I kind of made one more tweak that made it work even better which is adding a progress bar if anyone's worked in, in product design you know how good progress bars are like I, it, I think it appeals to our inner OCD where like you see something like half full and you're like I want to fucking f like just fill it up like you guys use LinkedIn. You see LinkedIn do it all the time, right? Your profile is 80% complete. It still like bugs me. I almost want to ask someone to like endorse, like you know, write me a testimonial or whatever. But progress bars are a god's end. And this kind of visual indicator, so like when you send a gift, you see the progress bar like move a little bit further, and you can see like how many gifts you have left to send today, works really, really well. The interesting thing with how well it works is it doesn't get, if you were someone that net, like, would send zero gifts, you probably will still send zero gifts. But the people that send kind of like five or six would then hit the limit of 20. So if you're like someone that does not care at all about you know, like engaging with this idiotic application, you just wouldn't touch it. But everyone else would like hit the artificial threshold you set. So this in turn, and this is an anecdote from, this is not my application, but it's such a great anecdote that I had to repeat it. But a friend of mine thought about, like, where else can you, what else can you apply artificial scarcity to? And he decided to apply it to monetization. Um, if any of you work in social games, you know in-app purchases are a large part of what drives your, drives your economy. I see Zaki there going like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like in-app purchases meant like are, are primarily how your application makes money. So he put up an artificial limit saying you can only spend ten dollars today. He had a progress bar that kind of tracked when you're getting there. And he I think even provided like an explanation, like we're trying to cut down on fraud, so you can't spend more than ten dollars. We're sorry guys. He put a progress bar there and it was working really well. But then he then he did something kind of fucked up, but also a little awesome when you think about it. And he did not enforce the $10 limit. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden, there were people that were spending a lot of money, and they thought they found a glitch. They were spending hundreds of dollars, <laughs> and they thought they found a glitch in the game that was letting them buy these items. Like clearly the programming was off, but it was entirely by design. So, uh, yeah, I, like, I, I love this story. I wish this was something I had done, but it sadly isn't. But I tell this all the time. But yeah, artificial scarcity is awesome. Like it's one of the most powerful techniques that's there, like not just with, not just with product design, but in, like in life. I mean, the whole idea of playing hard to get is nothing more than artificial scarcity with your time, like everything. Cool. Any questions about the whole artificial scarcity stuff? Awesome. So the third growth hack, and this is a really quick, fast one, but this is the one I kind of go to whenever anyone's like, dude, what's an example for growth hack? Like, what does this mean? And like, this is a great example because it's quick, Everyone can understand it, and it's the kind of thing that like, made me like, want to slap myself for not thinking of it before. So it only works on platforms where you have profile pages and some kind of aggregation center the way it works on Facebook, where you have your profile and then a news feed, or on Twitter, where you have your profile and a timeline. I mean, there's other platforms like that, and it only works there, but it's literally it's so stupid. So before implementing this, my stream stories looked a little like this. Ankur sent Jamie a flying kiss with the action link of send a flying kiss. And this would propagate to news feeds, my ex-girlfriend's news feed, my mom's news feed, saying Ankur sent Jamie a flying kiss, send a flying kiss. All I did was change Jamie with you. Like just change the target name, just replace the target name with the word you and all of a sudden, Ankur sent you a flying kiss, send a flying kiss. 
my ex-girlfriend's newsfeed on Chris Netty with Flying Kiss and a Flying Kiss. And it, it, it was shocking to me, but people did not know that how Facebook worked. Like, people would see this in their newsfeed and think it applied to them specifically. Like simply adding the word you in place of the target on a stream story changed the number of people that clicked it by order of magnitude, by, I think it, it doubled our click rate instantly. And that is ridiculously powerful when you think about it. Like the, the human ego is amazing. <laughs> it's amazing, right? Like, I, like I see, you see an acquaintance that you haven't seen in like six years and there's like a story she sent you something, oh yeah, it's me. Combined with like a lack of understanding of technology, like I, I still couldn't explain to my mom that the you in her feed does not mean her specifically. Like it's just not going to happen. But that's that's the power of you. Like one simple thing. Like it probably does not work as well anymore as like education catches up. But it still works. Like try it out. Just replace the, the target with the word you and watch what happens. Cool. <laughs> that was that was a flying kiss. I just <laughs> um, any other questions or requests for flying? <laughs> Anyone else want a flying kiss? No. Uh, cool. Um, multiple points of entry or. That's actually a very interesting question because we do have a complicated relationship. Um, yeah, I, I have had my share of issues with them. They've had my share of issues with me, but we're, we're good. We're good. <laughs> Um, no, like probably like 20, but a reasonable number. But the, the interesting thing is like we were an independent developer, so yeah, we definitely actually, like it, it actually is a serious topic because we did face problems that larger developers did not. Like we could not do the things that Zynga could do and get away with them. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Um, okay, number four, multiple points of entry. So I'm going to tell you the story of Brainfall. And you probably haven't heard of Brainfall. I'd be surprised if you did, because they died an unglamorous death like six months after launch. But there was a startup incubated at UC Berkeley where I went to school. They had, any of you guys heard of Tickle.com? One person. Um, Tickle.com was a personality quiz website that had lots of basic personality quizzes for free. Then they had premium quizzes like the Myers-Briggs and like a real IQ test and stuff for which they had, they sold monthly subscriptions. They were a pretty successful startup. They had an exit for 30 million, but then the company that acquired them shut them down. So Brainfall looked at this news and they were like, let's just replicate what Tickle did. And they launched, they launched Brainfall quizzes, which had good content, like, stupid quizzes, like the kind that I specialize in later, what type of drunk are you, like which Simpsons character are you, that kind of stuff. And the interesting thing is, they were, they were on Facebook, they were on Facebook before I was in the form of an application called Brainfall Personality Quizzes. And they had better content than I did. Yet I like saw this model and I was like, I want, like, you know, like I see the value to putting this kind of shit content on Facebook and like it's very, very viral stream stories. Yet they were not very successful at all. And like in my opinion, and this is my opinion alone, the reason they peaked at about 2,000 users while most of our quizzes got to hundreds of thousands of users in a matter of days was the name. Like they were called Brainfall Personality Quizzes. We had over 50 applications, each with their own independent name. And this is a really powerful principle when you think about it. Like, chances are you might not add an application called Brainfall Personality Quizzes because, like, dude, why would I add an app that makes me take personality quizzes? But you see an application called How Good a Lover Are You, which, like, piques your curiosity, and all of a sudden you want to take that. And the idea of just, like, breaking your, if, especially if your product has enough differentiated content, 
the idea of breaking it into independent applications is pretty much what I made my living off for three years and continue to do and advise other companies to do right now with a lot of success. Like we broke brainfall personality quizzes into how good a lover are you, what color are you, which is probably one of my proudest inventions because I had a random algorithm that just spat out a color with like a shit description. Like it was, it was literally like, it was like you are red, you are the color of passion and romance, you clearly care about people, or black, you're cool, you're mysterious, no one knows what you're up to, you have a, you have a secret side that if only people knew it, they'd truly understand who you were. But, or Dr. Phil's personality test, which uh, was a big moment for me back in 2009 when Dr. Phil actually addressed it on his TV show saying, you might have heard about this quiz on Facebook, like, that's not me. But, um, but yeah, this is really, really powerful. This is a principle I use again and again and use all the time. I use it, used it with gifts later on. I competed with my friend Zach Alia, who had free gifts, which was one of the first gifting applications. But by dividing it into hundreds of applications, we like far overtook what he was capable of doing. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, send your friends Bible verses. Like, a lot of people in religious parts of the country or the world might not add a free gifts application, but Bible verses speaks to them in a way that an application called free gifts wouldn't. Send your friends a Diwali cracker, which one of my friends told me sounded like a racist term from an Indian person. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, that, that application went viral in India and got as users in India that an application called Free Gifts would not have. And even though most of my experience was on Facebook, I'm doing a lot of stuff in mobile. And this works even better on mobile because of search-based discovery. Like, a lot of, how many of you guys work on mobile apps? Like you know how important the app store is to you. And by break, like by, I launched a suite of TV show quote games based on content available with WikiQuote and breaking it into 85 different applications with a TV show name and title in each application was the only reason this worked. Like if we had our master application called TV show quote game, like no one would have cared, but this way, like you're hitting, you're hitting the right search queries for pretty much every single TV show. So on mobile, if you have the kind of product that can be segmented into independent applications, like go for it. Like it will bring in users that otherwise would not come into your application. It's one of the best techniques I have right now for getting, uh, for getting a lot more downloads from the App Store. Any questions? So, have you heard from Wire from any of like Sandfield or Family Guy or anyone else? Uh, yeah, I well, so technically, technically, uh, they they all come under the Fair Use Act of the U.S. Copyright Law, so it's it's not it's theoretically not an issue. Like if you search Family Guy, like we're just using quotes that are in the public domain. Right. But um, but yeah, I mean. But if you make money off of it, it's not valid, right? It's that's not what the like the Fair Use Act, for instance talks about how, you, like, you know, if I write a review of a TV show on my blog, I can still make money of that because it's part of the fair use of the U.S. copyright law. I don't know how it works in Canada, but. Um, uh, is it always better to segment, like, are there pretty Okay, so, yeah, there is, there is one downside, and that is you lose the kind of ranking juice of having one big application. So if you're at a point where your master app can kind of break into the top 25, it does not make sense, but in general, it usually always does unless you find, unless you break it into different apps just for the sake of breaking into different apps. Like it should make some kind of logical sense to have different applications. Do you like lose out retention? For example, like once I've done the Seinfeld quiz, I wouldn't know there's a breaking bad quiz, but if I'm in the TV shows app, I'm like. Yeah, but that's a fault of my product and not the strategy. So yeah, that would, that would happen. Um, but in the, in the next one, I'll go over how other companies can have used this and can use this to, and they wouldn't suffer from this, but that comes down to your product. How brand aware do you think um, your audience might be? Like, would they want to still take on a Seinfeld TV app, or sorry, a 
um, TV quote quiz, uh, given that they've clicked on the Breaking Bad one, uh, knowing that it So they, they weren't, they were not brand aware at all, but they, like cross promotion still worked. So they probably did not care or could not distinguish my brand, but they, but if they were presented with an alternative app on that app, they definitely clicked, downloaded, and converted. But my brand meant nothing to them, and that was partially by design because I didn't have a brand that I was trying to promote. Do you think it works better for like short-term, almost bad type things rather than long-term brands? Uh, yes and no, in the sense that I'll give you a couple of counterexamples of how like established startups could use it, but it works very well for short-term things. But there's also, it, again, it comes down to your, to your product and what the individual app is. So I'll, yeah, I'll go over that really, really quickly. Anyone else? Cool. So the one downside that you have with, mul with uh, multiple points of entry is it's really tedious. Like having hundreds of applications, maintaining that is really, really painful. Like it's not, it's something that annoyed the crap out of me. Like on, when I launched the mobile applications, I like built tools to automate a lot of it, but it was still a complete pain in the ass. So the immediate solution, which works, is have users generate your points of entry. And that's kind of what I'm going to get into with how other startups can do this, but have users generate these independent applications, or in a lot of cases, just independent points of entry that gets people into your main product, even though they don't care about your specific product. I'll give you an example of Udemy. I teach a class on Udemy right now, and I've gotten people to sign up for Udemy, for Udemy even though they don't care about Udemy. They want to learn my class. Like, that's the power, like, a good instructor brings. Like Jack Welch is teaching a class on Udemy. That's why I signed up first. I'm like, I want to see what Jack Welch says. I don't care if it's on Udemy. I don't care what platform it's on. But Udemy is an example of a company using these distinguished points of entry to have other people kind of take, take care of their growth work. Like they have a network of instructors that do the growth work for them. And to that end, what they've started doing is they've, they've started building independent mobile applications that are entire courses in themselves. So they're high quality products. It's a full-fledged course. Like each application, you can, like it's a product you, like I've downloaded their Learn HTML app just to like see what it looks like. And it's a full-fledged app that you can take all the lectures, download physical copy, download offline copies of their lectures. Instructors can communicate announcements back and forth. And it's working for them because it's bringing in people that are searching learn HTML instead of, instead of Udemy. But the first step in their registration process is signing up for Udemy. So Udemy is getting all these signups just by using horizontal distribution. They're not doing it perfectly. The one change I would make if I were them is give instructors the tools to launch these apps themselves. They're, they still have a team launching them internally. I don't know why. Doesn't make sense, but they're thinking in the right direction. Another example of horizontal distribution is meetup.com. How many of you here joined meetup to come to this meetup? Right? Like you are now 10 people that are part of meetup.com just because Zakir or Achievers or one of us brought you in here. Like meetup.com, like you're doing user acquisition for meetup.com at the start of this lecture. You're telling people join meetup.com slash Achievers Tech. If you're not a member of meetup, that's, that's another example of horizontal distribution at work. And if meetup.com gave meetup organizers ways to launch their independent applications powered in their technology, all of a sudden they would have thousands of apps in the app store that would hit all the right keywords. Like Toronto Soccer, you'd find the Toronto Soccer League. Or like New York Tech, you'd find the New York Tech League. And if you give creators the tools to build powerful applications, like this does not have to be an application that you install quickly. Like a lot of people have intimate, um, yeah, a lot of people really care about the meetup groups they belong to. Last one, I'm gonna do this real quick, but CrowdTilt, which is like Kickstarter for anything, works the same way. You come into these products because of a campaign you really care about. Like I joined CrowdTilt for this campaign. I would not have joined otherwise, and now they spam my inbox all the fucking time. 
So, so now back to how we applied this with Facebook GIFs. So I built a GIFT application creator because it was just tedious to keep building my own GIFT applications, which was really, really simple. We had people upload an image, write a name of a GIFT in a singular and plural form, and in two steps launch their own applications. So when I say I had 10,000 applications, I mean, I probably didn't build 9,500 of them. It was built on our technology using the GIFT application creator. And this was interesting. I was really nervous going into this because as anyone that's worked with user-generated content knows, it can backfire. But it worked out pretty well. We had over 10,000 applications created. For one month, uh, July 2009, like I still have screenshots and all recorded because this is like the biggest moment of my life ever, we had more traffic than LinkedIn, New York Times, and Yelp, not collectively, just independently. But the coolest aspect about this is there were applications I would never have dreamt of, like, like just shit that like would never cross my mind. Some pretty funny stuff too. Like, this was a quiz application, not a gift application, but I'm sh you guys have seen the Lonely Island, I'm on a boat video, right? So right when this exploded in popularity, someone created a quiz saying, are you on a boat? <laughs> and no matter what you answered, the stream story published was, I'm on a fucking boat. <laughs> and that like went viral, right? That's the kind of thing that you do not plan for, but user-generated content will bring you. And yeah, the most popular applications were an unidentifiable Russian word, like friendship bracelets, blessings from God, and flaming bags of poop, <laughs> which for some reason was really popular in the United Kingdom and United Kingdom alone. <laughs> I don't know, go figure. But like everything else, there was, there was a downside to user-generated content, as there usually is, and it's always the same downside. <laughs> Penises. Lots and lots and lots of penises. I, I think about 2 to 3 percent of applications that were created were penis applications. <laughs> they were cartoon GIFs, they were the weirder kind, which is a guy maybe taking a picture of his own penis, which you have a question, right? <laughs> No, Anthony Weiner is the 1%, man. Uh, but yeah, like it was, I, I don't know what the user like motivation there is. Like there'd be a guy named, like there was a guy named Muhammad and he had an application called Muhammad's Penis and then he like, he, he built a gift application with a picture of his penis and then he would send 20 of them to all of his friends every day. <laughs> like, and like, I mean, we had an automated system. It took us a few days to catch it. So they'd get a little request like, you just received Muhammad's penis from Muhammad. Do you want to accept it? <laughs> but that is the downside of all user-generated content. Uh, any questions, any non-penis related questions about this last hack? Yeah, so uh, for all the applications that are built, where all of them are like linked to the logo that of your company or any way is it associated with the company that you have? So we had, a, we had aggressive cross promotion set up. Like, so it's like, oh, you just send a uh, blank. Do you want to send other stuff? But with no intelligence. We were pulling in like random well-performing apps. Okay. And they ran our advertisements. But other than that, there was no like branding link. There was no branding. Okay. Did any merchants send out gift cards for customers and send up hourly to their friends? <laughs> Um, no, but that, that would have been, that, that, that's an interesting idea that we theoretically thought about, thought about getting into, but it just turned out that we were, like at the time when you have like these kinds of applications, this kind of traffic, you don't have room to blink. Like we were trying to keep our servers going, we we're trying to just like keep everything, like there was a time when this first like exploded where if your user ID was divisible by two, you saw an error page because we had to like block 50% of people from accessing it. So we never got to a point where it had, I sold, I sold the entire suite right when I thought it was a good time. So we never got to a point to truly explore branding opportunities. But I mean, there definitely were apps, user created apps like send your friend Starbucks coffee 
but that was just like users creating their own content. So do you consider a viewer alone as opposed to like a lot of content, like plus feed sort of thing, uh, something that people will be interested in? Are you talking? Sort of it's actually funny. Like there was, there was like per most provocative content did not work for some reason. The stuff that really worked was different kinds of like religious content and like happy, feel good, here's a friendship bracelet content. And it's interesting because this is like just the market telling us what works. Like we had very little moderation. We only deleted things that were completely offensive. Like anything raunchy we wouldn't delete in of itself. But provocative content did not work as well as just like bars of chocolate and that kind of stuff. And I think a lot of it is when you think about the demographic that was adding this app, these applications it was generally we're definitely biased towards older women were our core demographic. Yeah, I think I think mobile is definitely mobile is, is definitely very interesting when you pair it up with uh, with independent applications and just creating more points of discovery to get people into your product the way the way Udemy did. Did you have a more specific question or I mean, it's, it's almost an entirely different, we can talk about this offline, I'll go over it like quickly in 20 seconds, but yeah, mobile and Facebook have very little in common. The biggest difference in mobile is all your discovery happens either through the app store or what I consider real world virality where you just hear about it from people, as opposed to Facebook where almost all discovery happens through communication channels. Cool, Pac-Man story. If anyone here works for Namco, I'm sorry. I branded it something else. Don't worry about it. Um, but if any of you guys have come to a lot of tech talks or talks about growth or have researched the space, lean startup, this kind of stuff, you hear about how important data is all the time. Like everyone tells you, measure this, measure that. Like test, measure, optimize, rinse, repeat, like record everything. And all that is well and good, but at this point, all your competitors are using data too. Like everyone worth their weight has got data, is tracking the right things. There's always things you can measure better and things you can measure differently. But what, I, what concerns me as someone that's been in this space for a while is the over-reliance on data that we're seeing right now. Like everyone, and I've been victim to that too. Like it's very easy to get caught micro-optimizing a single feed story, trying to get more people to click on it. But before you know it, I've wasted a week getting 7% of people to click through on something that 6% of people were clicking through on, which is good, but you tend to lose sight of the bigger picture. Like there's a big tendency to optimize towards the local maxima when you're, when you're just working on data all the time. Like you keep trying to find the small wins. And it was while I was running a really really basic Pac-Man flash game on Facebook that I got to a point where I was just sick, sick and tired of just like these micro optimizations that I decided to just like try random shit. Like literally, like the sites, like the slide sounds facetious, but it's true. Like, like you cannot underestimate the importance of just trying like the crazy ideas in your brain. The shit, like the stuff that you think sounds ridiculous, like, like the importance of that cannot be understated. And with the Pac-Man game, I tried a bunch of experiments. And one of them was offering users a $2,000 replica Pac-Man machine to the person that referred the most people to the application. And I really liked this idea because you could not incentivize Facebook viral channels. like That, that was illegal. But if you gave them a referral link that they then posted on their own wall and event walls, that was fine because it's not a Facebook viral channel. But this really, really took off. Like a retro gamer forum discovered us, sent a bunch of traffic, and people really cared about this item more than they would have cared about a $2,000 laptop, for instance, because in my opinion, it might be one of those items that would be cool to have, but you can't justify spending $2,000 on a Pac-Man machine, right? Like, 
Like, I'd like to have it, but I wouldn't want to spend the money to buy this. And these were users on Pac-Man. So this worked out incredibly well, like brought in thousands of new users. And like most of the competitions of this variety, it got in, towards the end, it got into a bidding war between two people, which is when it got really fun because they had a sunk cost effect going for them. They were both like completely in it. And they started buying ads to my application, <laughs> which, which this is not reproducible probably, but there were two days of these people desperately buying hundreds of dollars of ads to my application under their referral link in order to win the Pac-Man machine, which is the kind of thing that just, you just have to try stuff to let this kind of thing happen. And the takeaway from this is, I mean, I've tried to replicate this with mixed success, never had the same degree of success. Generally, you get close to you know, making a small ROI, sometimes no ROI. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend trying this strategy specifically. Yeah, like A-B testing is kind of what I try my regimented stuff. Like weird shit is just like, you know, like things I would normally never think about trying. Like just like have a big button that says buy my product and nothing else. Just, just give you an example, but it's just, it's generally stuff that it's so unexpected that you're not comparing it with anything. You'd, you'd know in minutes if you have enough traffic or days if it's going to work or not. I, I'm not looking, with weird stuff, I don't try for micro-optimizations. It's just like, let's just try something very different from what we've been doing before. But yeah, the takeaway is just try stuff. When the two were competing against each other, did you show uh, Of course. I should, have, I should have brought that up. But yeah, we had a visual, visual leaderboard that showed, um, that showed who, you were, who you were in relation with. But, it was, but depending on how far down you were in the list, it did not show you that much information. So if you were 37th and had like 500 referrals to go, it only showed you you were 37th and not how far away you were. But for the first few people, we kind of give them a live tally. Because when people are far away, like those numbers are just going to demoralize them. Any other question? For a lot of these stuff, you rely on an ad-based revenue model, or what was your model definition? So for most of the applications, it was largely display advertising based. For the friend quizzes, which grew really big towards the end, it was about 50% virtual currency, 50% display advertising, where you could either you could either like answer questions about your friends in order to unlock the answer, or you could download Internet Explorer 9 or pay me a dollar. So in those cases, it was about 50% virtual currency. Cool. The last one, which I call the blacklist of doom, which is conveniently covering the iStock photo logo on that picture back there. <laughs> but, and this isn't really a growth hack, but it's just something that I did on Facebook. And I really, I really like talking about this. This is something so easy. You can do it. Anyone can do it. And it worked really well for what it was designed. So something I hear all the time is, don't worry about your competition, which is true for a lot of products, right? Like, you don't want to worry about your competitors, get caught up with what they're doing. But one, that's really not pragmatic in general. Two, it's especially not pragmatic with growth. Like, most forms of growth channels saturate really quickly, like everything from Facebook notifications to the App Store to Craigslist. Like any channel you have to grow, as soon as your competitors find out what you're doing, they saturate. And this was even more important for me at the time because Facebook application development was a fairly incestuous space. Like I knew 10 other guys who at, that, at this point were my friends, but also biggest competitors. And I wanted to do what I could to keep everyone away, for everyone to like not see all the like weird viral shit that I've been doing. So this is my 30-minute solution. And it's still reproducible if your application is based on Facebook or Facebook Connect, where you have most of your users coming in that way. And all you have to do is find the Facebook user ID of two to three people at every company you're concerned about. So I got user IDs from people at Facebook, Zynga. I put Mark Zuckerberg in that list. Don't want him on my stuff. Um, 
and you build a I built a list of about 100 people of, that I was primarily concerned about without overthinking who might or might not be there. And then I just used this simple pseudocode, which I'll go over. But when a person lands on the application, see if they're a Facebook friend of anyone on the blacklist. So you have 100 people on your blacklist. If anyone, if the user is a friend of that person, block that growth feature. And with that, you block everyone you could be concerned about. People at Facebook, Zynga are all friends with each other. And with this like one quick hack, you block everyone from seeing anything you don't want them to. This worked so, so unbelievably well. And at this point, I just wanted to share it. But cool. This kind of wraps up the, the seven growth hacks. Now would be a great time for applause. Yeah. Now, la last round of questions. Have you ever considered uh, social marketing? Say, uh, you give uh, uh, kind of rewards for uh, getting friends of friends. So, not just like first level rewards, but multiple level. Do you think the incentive is strong enough? Like, I don't know. I haven't done it, but do do you think that that's a strong enough incentive to a user to get a friend of a friend involved? The fast kind of uh, currency is like you have some. Short answers, I've never tested it. I've only done one degree of friend connections. I, I'm skeptical of it. It's not to say it can't be done, and maybe data will prove me wrong, but intuitively, I don't think, I don't think it's a very powerful model. Like, I don't personally care about my friends of friends. I doubt my users would be that motivated but I could be wrong. Like, it's more about them making money for you rather than you working hard for them. Wait, so like a pyramid scheme? Or? Yeah. Oh. OK, I see. I get it now. Um, interesting. Yeah, but that, that's like traditional affiliate right? I've never touched that myself. But yeah, that would definitely, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting world in, in of itself. Um, so the question was, what different ways do I use to monetize my data? And uh, so this is, if you refer to specifically my application data and not how I monetize my applications, is that your question? We didn't monetize it. Like, it sounds amateurish at this time, but at the time, we were doing all we could. We, I had minor interactions. My, like, there were a couple of people that were building an advanced search engine to who, with whom we shared the data after our users opted into it. But we weren't making money of it. With that said, we did have advertising integrated. And part of what our advertisers paid us was with what they did with our data. So directly, we did nothing. But yeah, to the degree that when I closed up shop, I had a database of 50 million email addresses that I, I ended up, that I have done very little with. Because all the offers I got were from I didn't I didn't I could have sold it to like an email mar email marketing aka Viagra pills kind of agency, <laughs> but I just didn't want to enter that world at all. By the way, this is one of the best talk I've been in, in like uh, achievers. So Thank you. Amazing. Uh, my question was, what's the product life cycle goes by? So in in the company, when you have like an idea that I want to build this feature and you have like ten in mind, how do you go about like okay I'm, I'm going to build this? And I'm going to build this for like minimal viable feature as like just go all in. How do you go about it? So, go about it? so the question was, uh, what is the product life cycle on what I worked on? Like, how would I go about uh, hypothesizing a feature and then going to implementing it and putting it out in production? Right. Um, so this is interesting. It started out with me developing myself, and as I already alluded, I was a shit developer. So I. I've never used source code management in my life. Like I would edit like stuff on production, like break things all the time. But um, in general, then when I transitioned to a development team, it was still super quick. Pretty much like the advantage of doing the kind of work we did is everything had a one to two day development period total. Push it out, 
And if we have enough traffic at the time, we can tell in three hours whether it's working or not, and then roll it back. Because yeah, when you're doing when you're doing even 100,000 users a day, three hours of data is more than statistically significant to tell how well a certain feature is performing. And we just like roll it back immediately if it wasn't. Do you have any experience on our LTL side Facebook? Um, a lot of it. Like right now, most of the most of the work I do is virality on mobile, which of which Facebook, which as I said, is an entirely different beast. Most of it is determined by how inherently viral your product is, which is like, and the app store. So a lot of so a lot of what I do now is kind of optimizing, optimizing what you can get out of the app store, right? From how to find the right keywords, like app store SEO to like the horizontal distribution stuff I talked about still works very well on mobile. Do you want to? Yeah. Uh, quick question. Uh, have you done anything with LinkedIn? And if so, what's different about that? It, that's interesting. I haven't touched LinkedIn. I did build a viral app on Twitter. But I have thought about LinkedIn. But the short answer is no, I haven't done anything. To me, it looks like a really interesting platform. I see people building a couple of uh, products around LinkedIn messaging. And it's interesting, but I haven't touched it myself. All right, once again, one more round of applause for Ankur. And I believe the technical term is penai. I've never been in a position where I had to refer to multiple penises at once. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just to close off, um, before I get into this, uh, one thing that I usually forget to do, and I'm not going to forget tonight, uh, we host these great events. All of you guys make it happen, but the special people that I want to thank are the Achievers staff that are really taking their own time um, and doing this for free just because they, they want to help out and they want to see this community grow. So a big round of applause for the Achievers staff. As always, uh, we are hiring, so if you are interested in any position at Achievers, you can talk to somebody in one of the purple lanyards. If not, just hang out, uh, have some beers. And like we always mention, our goal at Achievers Tech is to give back to the Toronto tech community. So as Eric just talked to me a little bit earlier, um, if you guys know people that are interested in doing talks, we have an amazing framework with almost 1,000 members. We have the next couple of talks uh, booked, but you know, going into the later part of the year and the next, uh, next year, we have a lot of open slots. So if you're interested in giving a talk, if you know somebody that's interested in giving a talk, just reach out on any of our social networks or email us. Um, if you have questions for Ankur, you can put them up on the social networks. I will relay the questions personally and make sure they get answered. Um, other than that, hang out, have a few drinks. Uh, Uncle will be around for a little bit to answer any questions you may have. And hopefully, we'll see you at the next one. Uh, we'll post it in a couple of days. Thank you, guys.